Hello, I'm Dave Ortega from the Somerville Media Center, and once again I am glad to be joined with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal for another news roundup produced by Somerville Media Center and the Somerville Journal. How are you doing, Julia? Welcome to you. I'm good, Dave. How are you? I'm doing all right. Good. Um, as we have been doing uh, for the past few months, we have started off the news roundup with uh, COVID-19 statistics being in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, what are the what are the trends? I know you spoke with some people in the city and some others about this. Uh, what do you know, Julia? Thank you. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, now, I think more than ever, this is kind of on, on people's minds, especially given the holiday that we just had and the holiday that is coming up. Um, so I really wanted to address some of the questions um, that have been coming up for me just as a human person. <laughs> during this. Um, I live in, you know, Cambridge right around Davis Square myself. Um, so I, I think that it's really important that we're all paying attention to the most recent and up-to-date public health data that's coming out around holiday travel and around the infection rates in our communities. Um, because I uh, just yesterday published a story um, about how, you know, the second surge that we've all been hearing about and talking about that's happening throughout the country, it's, it's happening here too. Even though Somerville has done and continues to do a pretty good job of containing this, um, it is very much here as well. And it's, it's just crystal clear when you look at the um, very helpful Somerville kind of COVID dashboard that they presented, which they update, I think, twice weekly. Um, so when you when you look at that, um, you can pretty clearly see in the in the graphs that like the the, the spike is here. Um, it's it you know when you look at like where we were in April versus where we are now, um, it's it's higher now than it was in April. So I think one of the um, most interesting kind of tables that they have, um, if you just scroll down a little bit, um, let's see that first. Yeah, so this is kind of a really good. Um, graph to see that visually if you look at that april where we were all quarantining and staying inside our homes and doing absolutely nothing right we're actually we're coming down a little bit right now but we are we were higher than that um near the end of november so it's just something to keep in mind <laughs> that like even though the world has opened up a little and you know there's dining that's available which wasn't available in april this is still very much present here with us mm. um but if you scroll down a little bit more um, there are a number of kind of here again is a different view. Um, scroll down a little bit more. Um, this just shows like the number of cases over time. But if you look at the positive cases by month, um, this is a really good way to kind of understand where we're at. So like in April, like the worst of it, right? And even though I will note that our testing capacity wasn't necessarily um, as high as it is now. So we may not have been catching all of the cases that were present in April. Um, our, our rate right now is pretty high. We've had 724 confirmed, confirmed positive cases just in Somerville um, um, in November. So, and when you look at like where we were in July at 84, like this is, this is a very significant jump, even just from October, um, that, that's pretty big. Um, and our testing capacity has remained pretty consistent since October. So that really does reflect where the surge is at at the moment. Um, so I think kind of, you know, I, I was curious about this. I wanted to know what this meant. So I, I got in touch with um, the Cambridge Health Alliance, um, as well as um, Somerville's Director of Health and Human Services, Doug Kress. And I just asked, like, where are you guys at with testing? You know, are you prepared for what's going on? Um, are you better prepared than you were? Um, and CHA definitely said that, you know, they are much better prepared with PPE, with testing capacity than we were in April. Of course, we know so much more now than we did. Um, but, you know, demand for testing remains really high. Um, CHA has shifted a little bit, so they're only scheduling out five days in advance. And I think this is a tactic to try to ensure that this is people who need tests, not people who are scheduling out tests so they can travel or do something else. Um, when I spoke with them earlier this week, they were fully booked and scheduling appointments for next week. Um, and they did notably see a pretty significant uptick and requests for testing before Thanksgiving. Um, and what they said is that, you know, they encourage people who feel they have been exposed to COVID to get tested um, and encouraged people to follow the CDC guidance, which calls for staying at home. And the reason why I wanted to note on this is because for a lot of Somerville's response for this pandemic, um, there's been a general kind of like, you know, everyone should get tested, you know what I mean? Get tested if you're curious, 
um, get tested if you're seeing this person or not, like, but, you know, quarantine and stay home as much as you can. Yeah. Um, but one thing when I looked at the CDC website, I noticed is in, you know, right on the front, it says not everyone needs to get tested. Um, and they note specifically that people who have symptoms, people who had, have had close contact with someone with confirmed COVID, or people who have been asked or referred to get tested by a provider, health department, et cetera. Mm. So that's pretty specific. Um, and I think why this is relevant is because, you know, we've just had Thanksgiving. The city of Somerville and CHA confirmed that there were higher kind of requests for testing before Thanksgiving. And that this was largely due to people probably wanting to travel and see their families. And this is not, according to the CDC, this is not the way that we should be going about this. And I think this is something we should keep in mind just as we're kind of heading into Christmas that, um, you know, a lot of people traveled for Thanksgiving. It takes about two weeks for us to kind of see the impact of higher exposure, right? So in probably a week or so, we may begin to see an uptick in cases from the people who traveled in Thanksgiving which will be about two weeks before Christmas. Um, so this is why it's so important to stay up to date with things because things can change so quickly. Um, but those people will probably need testing. It's important that they have access to testing and that people who do not have COVID, have not been exposed to COVID, but simply want to see their families, don't clog up our testing channels before the holidays. Um, and you know, to be frank, like, like I said, I'm a human. I want to see my family desperately. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I miss them so much. Um, and I, I think though, it's still um, like one thing Doug Kress said, I just want to share kind of a quote is that the sooner we can control the virus, the sooner we'll be able to get together. And we need to have difficult conversations with our family and friends to change how we are gathering this year so we can be around next year together. Um, and it's, it's a little bit, doom and gloom, <laughs> I understand. Um, but it hit me um, because I keep thinking that like, you know, no matter the kind of um, exhaustion and fatigue that we are all feeling with this virus, this isolation, that it's one year, and, you know, it's one holiday. And, you know, if we can just protect each other this one year, then hopefully next year we'll all be here and we'll all be able to get together again. Um, so, you know, I just encourage people to kind of keep up to date. We have ongoing coverage of this. Keep checking with CHA, keep checking the city of Somerville's website, um, because I think we're going to have to make some hard decisions. And after speaking to Director of Health and Human Services, Doug Kress and CHA, did they have any reasoning behind the uh, dramatic increase in cases between October and November? No, not, they honestly didn't. I think they like um they so they did not directly attribute it to the higher like desire for testing for thanksgiving i think the general kind of thought around that is that many of those tests were not for people who have been exposed <laughs> at all um but who just wanted to kind of take the precaution which you know is a great thought of course um a good instinct um so no they didn't directly kind of address why that jump happened but i think um if you if you look at data it's this is not somerville specifically and this is communities across Massachusetts and across the country and I think you know it has to do with the weather um, it has to do with the fact that you know people are indoor dining is still allowed so people are dining indoors you know I mean because it's getting colder outside so there's just more people gathering indoors and one thing that the governor has addressed is that the vast majority of this spread now is not happening at like big gatherings it's happening at gatherings of like five to 10 people. It's happening at those small Thanksgiving dinners, you know what I mean, where you see people outside your pod, it's happening when you, know, when you go get a drink with a friend inside who is not necessarily in your pod, you know what I mean? If you just break quarantine to like hang out with a few of your friends, even if it's under the 10 person gathering limit in Somerville, like that is where the majority of the spread is happening because people are kind of just getting complacent. Um, and because so many people are asymptomatic for this uh, right, virus, right? So um, it's not isolated to Somerville, um, which is, I think, reflective that this is kind of a trend of behavior kind of across a wider area. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a, a vaccine is on its way. Uh, it's not going to be tomorrow, but it is on its way. 
that's, you know, just to kind of jump on that for a second, um, I was reading the New York Times this morning and they had kind of a, you know, um, draft timeline, if you will, of like when people, different populations might get the vaccine um, because the two of vaccine, Moderna, Moderna and Pfizer are set, are going to go before the FDA for approval this month. Um, so theoretically, um, people could start getting the vaccination this month, um, starting with, I think, um, people in long-term care facilities and healthcare workers. Um, but, you know, when you when you look at that, um, it's going to take some time, you know what I mean? Uh, this New York Times timeline had, like, um, you know, the long-term care facility and healthcare workers in December, but this vaccine also requires two shots. So there's going to need to be two doses, so then they will get dosed again a month later and then they will be they will have the full vaccination so this is gonna it's gonna be a process you know what I mean and after they get tested then it will be elderly folks people over the age of 65 most likely people who are frontline workers in different capacities um and it probably won't reach the likes of us for a while um probably I think spring is what the New York Times was estimating um, and even then, like, we're still going to have to be taking certain precautions because it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's like, woo, like home free. Um, but still it's on the horizon, you yeah. know what I mean? which is kind of another reason, like you were, like you said, to kind of just like, hang on to not get like, so, um, so attached to this one holiday that like, we make really, really stupid decisions and lose people. We love to over 250,000 people have died in this country of this virus. I mean, and it's like, the end is like, it's barely in sight, but it is, you know, in that sense that people will start being protected very soon. So if we can just kind of hope, you know, cling to that hope just a little bit um, and just kind of make those hard decisions in the next month, we may be okay a little, you know what I mean? So yeah, thank you for bringing up the vaccines. Moving on to some news that is on a lot of people's minds right now is uh, civilian oversight of the police. And the city has uh, taken some action on that and hired uh, uh, two, new, two new hires uh, for civilian oversight of the police, which um, I believe it hopes to be a, na a national model for. Uh, what do you know about that, Julia? Yeah, this is, you know, this is a big move regionally, um, but it's also just a big move in Somerville because um, at the at this meeting when they were um, hiring these two new staff members, um, the, I think the Matt McLaughlin, the city council president noted that this is the first time in 170 years that the city council has hired dedicated staff. Um, and he, so it's, it's a, it was like kind of a historic occasion um, and, you know, a bit unprecedented um, so, you know, they were really excited and they were happy, you know, thanking the counselors on the hiring committee and, you know, the generosity of the mayor for funding these positions. Um, so what is kind of going on is, you know, there are a number of ways that the city has committed to looking into civilian oversight of the police. Um, the mayor is engaged in hiring um, a director of racial and social justice. And when you read the job, job description, part of that position is to kind of oversee the community process around this. Um, and that kind of is on the administrative side. And these two new staff appointments are on the legislative side. Um, so the positions they filled are a legislative um, and policy analyst position and a public outreach coordinator. Um, and the people, and, you know, just my own humble opinion, the people they chose um, and that were unanimously appointed at the city council meeting seem pretty darn cool. Um, and regardless of your opinion, they, they seem epically qualified for the positions that they were hired to do, um, which is pretty cool. So um, at this meeting, um, just hang on, let me pull this up. Um, they also were appointed very quickly. Usually appointments go through the confirmation of appointments committee and this whole process. And um, because these were hired by a committee of count, um, these were recommended by a small um, committee of city councilors. They went to the full council meeting and were approved at the full council meeting. So it was very quick. And they said that that was on purpose because they really want to get started on this. Um, so the people that were hired um, for the legislative and policy analyst position, it was Iram Decina, um, who is a law graduate of Suffolk Law, 
Um, she graduated in 2019. She's a Miami native, but she has lived in Somerville for the past four years. Um, she moved here to go to law school. Um, she's very interested in community work um, and has a pretty um, impressive record. Um, what I thought was really cool is McLaughlin asked her during this appointment process, um, you know, suppose we draft legislation that's, you know, admired nationwide, like what would you like to say that you've accomplished? Um, and she seemed really on board with that. She, her response was that she wanted to be a part of creating a more wide lens model instead of something that's more incident responsive. Um, because she noted that in this year where, you know, there were so many protests and such a kind of strong reaction to some of the brutality that's been going on, that there were a lot of um, kind of immediate responses and like reforms in small ways, but not necessarily ones that were well thought out or that could apply more broadly. And that she really wants to be a part of creating something that can be, that can be used as a model, which is a big goal of Somerville. Um, so that's really cool. Um, the other person hired, um, their name is R. Mason. They go by Mason um, for, for the public outreach coordinator position. And um, this person has a, a incredible um, resume of educational work, of healthcare work, of community work, um, and seems it just has done so much in education and training, especially. Um, they currently work at um, Fenway Health, I believe, um, working with um, HIV patients who have fallen out of the care continuum. Um, and they really, um, they really kind of highlighted the importance of finding common ground. Um, and the kind of it, the stated goal of this position was really wanting to find someone who would like have these really complicated conversations with people who weren't excited about this, people who were, you know, especially impacted communities who are often hard to get involved in these community processes. Um, and he he provided some really really cool responses in terms of how he was going to do that work. Um, so it's it, you know it's just the beginning. They've just hired them, so the work is just starting. Um, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, and I do believe they're also interviewing for the director of racial and social justice. So I think some of this, as these positions kind of get to work, we're going to start seeing a little bit more, like more community meetings and more opportunities for public input. Like as this really gets rolling, we're not quite there yet, but this was a really cool beginning. Moving on to another topic that's on a lot of people's minds. It has been for a very long time is affordable housing and the affordable housing overlay that the city council is working on. Uh, what can you tell us about that, Julia? Sure. Um, so this is, um, there's been a lot of discussion about this in committee at the city council. Um, many people who pay attention at all to the community process knows that a big zoning overhaul was approved last year. Um, and overlay districts are kind of like a, um, an opportunity to just kind of like create, I mean, create opportunities in different districts without having to redo like the whole zoning code. Um, and they have like specific things. So there's like a small business district overlay. This is the affordable housing overlay. And I, I kind of think of it like you have a map underneath and this is like kind of like a transparent thing with like fun little colors that like goes on top <laughs> that shows where you can do different things. And that's my own visual brain, I guess. But I think it's really cool. Um, and so this is um, kind of been newsworthy because there was recently a public hearing on this. Um, it's not completely um, finished yet. There is a pretty significant draft that's been worked through many times. Um, but the public, the point of a public hearing, of course, is to get public input. Um, so they had this public hearing and are kind of now reviewing it. Um, it was a joint hearing of the council and planning board. So this is before the planning board. And once they approve a draft, it will go to the city council for approval. So we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, but the planning board is expected to review this at their December, I think, 17th meeting. Um, and I know it is a stated legislative priority of um, the chair, Ben Ewan Campin, to like get this done. Uh, the, the council committee chair, Ben Ewan Campin, to get this done before the end of the year. We'll see if that happens, but hopefully not far after the, the beginning of the new year. Um, so the kind of deal with this is that... Um, this overlay is meant to support the development of affordable housing in certain neighborhoods of the city. And the way that this happens is there are certain, um, with the kind of base zoning, there are certain density um, requirements, there are certain height restrictions that go with where you're going to be building. And what this does is it says, if you are going to commit to building 100% affordable housing, 
you get to kind of like go by these rules and not these rules. So if you're going to build in this district, district where normally you'd only get to build two stories, you can build four stories if you're going to be building 100% affor affordable housing. Or you can build a different type of building um, or have more units than you would have been allowed if you were going by the base zoning. Um, and this a lot of, and there's, there's more to this, of course. Um, zoning is very complicated, <laughs> but um, all, all of this work came out of um, many months of, of several weeks of interviews with affordable housing developers like the Somerville Community Corporation, for example, saying like, what are the barriers that you face, you know what I mean, to building affordable housing in this city? And a lot of that was like, well, it's really hard to kind of meet the bottom line when we have to go by these restrictions, but we're offering units at a reduced rate. So that's kind of the, where this kind of thinking around, you know, in, increased density, increased height, et cetera, comes from. Um, so there's a pretty broad support for this. Um, I listened to the public hearing and I think nearly every comment was generally in support of this existing. Um, people are excited about, you know, more affordable housing. A lot of some of our residents are involved in this and know that there is a serious housing crisis in this region and that, you know, whatever we can do to increase um, housing, the stock of affordable housing is a really good thing. Um, there were, of course, like a couple comments. Um, um, Renee Scott, who uh, is one of the co-founders of Green and Open Somerville, said she was really in support of the overlay, but did express concerns that it currently allows a deviation from the allowance for the minimum green score and open space requirement, which means this wouldn't they wouldn't have to build as much green space or open space. And she noted that we are in the middle of the sixth mass extin extinction and that every single bit of natural space is really important um, and that people who live in affordable housing also deserve access to open space. So she advocated you know, to approve this, but to get rid of that because she thinks that you know, any developer, wherever they're building, no matter what they're building, should be required to contribute to the city's kind of stock of green and open space. Um, so this is just to say that, you know, if you're still interested in this, there's still opportunities to get involved. I would reach out to the planning board. Um, and definitely if you have questions, reach out to um, Councilor Ewan Campen. Um, but yeah, something to pay attention to if you're interested, um, but there's more to come. And some not so great news. Um, there were a couple of businesses that closed their doors last week, um, Moroccan Hospitality on Somerville Ave and once ballroom on Highland Ave, um, you know, once was pretty well known regionally as a live music venue. It was known for its quirkiness, um, for, for kind of uh, not being as polished maybe as, as some other uh, music venues. And unfortunately uh, it, it had to close its doors as, as it's kind of impossible to, to gather together in, in a live music setting. Um, what can you tell us about that, Julia? Sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, once in Moroccan Hospitality are very different cases, of course. Um, Moroccan Hospitality was a restaurant in Union Square. Um, they've been there for quite a while. Um, and when I talked to um, one of the sisters who owns the place, they said that, um, you know, it you know, they were doing really great. They usually have really busy winters um, and they were having a great winter. Um, but that business just dropped off just, just exponentially, I mean, awfully um, when COVID hit. And she noted that especially they, they did a lot of catering for like the big universities in this area, which was completely non-existent, um, obviously, because no one was holding events. Um, so she said, you know, they were, they were very, very sad um, to have to close. You know, their Facebook post had hundreds of comments expressing sadness to see them go, um, you know, and she, she said, you know, it's been really hard um, and they're going to miss it a lot. And, you know, I asked her if she was, um, if they were going to reopen, hopefully. Um, and she said that, you know, it's just hard to say because it takes so much money to open a restaurant. And right now they kind of did all they could to just keep it open and they don't have much and kind of, they're just both thinking about getting other jobs at the moment to kind of survive. Um, which is just so, it's so hard. Um, and of course, you know, they're not the only one restaurants and businesses are closing across the state and country. Um, once was definitely, I'm sure you feel this too, a hit. Like anyone who is kind of up with community knows like, you know, of course they're known for their, li li as a live independent music venue, you know what I mean? 
but they host community meetings, you know what I mean? And they're, they're just a, a gathering place, you know, for, for the yeah. community. And if anyone has been there, they'll know just how, how very cool this space is. You know, it's just cool. <laughs> like, it's just really beautiful and fun and um, so random, you know what I mean, on, on Highland Ave. And their facade is, you know, so funky. And like, um, I, you know, over the course of this pandemic, I've talked to JJ Johnson, the founder of Once, um, a few times um, about just the plight of music venues. And it really, um, I think this, this just hit me. I mean, um, because it just shows just the failure, I think, of, of you know, our, our government, federal government, you know, it's not like Somerville, I know Somerville is doing so much, um, but to, to save these venues, these, these venues that depend on people being able to gather, you know what I mean? Um, and it just made me think more about, you know, theater and, and music and dance and, you know, all of these, just all of these spaces, you know what I mean? Um, the Armory, you know what I mean? When we did our arts panel uh, last month talking about how they're, I mean, they host what 750 events, I think Stephanie Sherp said a year, like what happens when you can't do that? Yeah. Um, and what I think is interesting about once, um, I know you talked to JJ as well as, um, boy, did they pivot. Like, you know, they started this virtual venue. I was talking to her about this in April. You know what I mean? Like they were on it. And they have this YouTube page and they were getting people to subscribe and they were having all these artists. They've kept up like a steady stream of shows on this for months, which is very, it's very impressive amidst yeah. everything else that's going on. Um, and Once is also kind of a project of this, the kind of umbrella company is Cuisine and Locale, right? Which is her catering company. And they also started um, doing like mac and cheese takeout. They were doing like trays of mac and cheese um, as a takeout option for people because, you know, their main kind of bar as a source of revenue wasn't operational. Um, so they, I mean, they tried, they yeah. were selling merch, they were doing all sorts of things, but in the end, like the kind of ban on any sort of gathering was just, it wasn't possible. Um, yeah. So I did notice that, um, you know, they didn't completely preclude the possibility of reopening um, there. You know, I think JJ noted on Facebook that like, hopefully they'll find another space and, you know, have another another one small room. Um, but it's a big loss for Somerville. And just to close things up, uh, Union Square Main Streets is kind of the uh, business organization for the Union Square businesses. And they're hosting a holiday stroll Friday, December 4th through the 12th. And uh, participants have a chance of winning up to $1,000 for helping to judge uh, storefronts. So. There's there's an initiative to participate uh, if you need if you need some extra cash uh, so you can shoot, you can visit unionsquaremain.org to find out more information. Um, yeah, and something else small. Um, the illumination store that everyone loves so much in Somerville is still on, not quite like it normally is. I know everyone loves those beautiful trolley tours that the Somerville Arts Council does. Um, there will be no trolley tours, um, but they are still encouraging people to decorate their homes, and they have a. Google form out. Uh, we have an article, it's on their website as well, um, to kind of sign up because they're going to make a map of the city so that people can just do a little holiday walk, whether it's in their neighborhood or down the community path and kind of discover some of these new lights and art fixtures. Um, so check that out for sure. I know I will. Um, and one other small thing is I know the Armory is launching their winter farmer's market. So there's info on the Armory website. We'll be posting some as well. It launches um, December 5th. It goes through April 10th. Of course, like many other things, you have to sign up in advance, um, but this is another great opportunity to support local vendors um, and just kind of get in even some little holiday spirit while supporting local people. So, something. And that's all we have time for today, Julia. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Julia Talies, I'm from the Somerville Journal. If you want more information about any of these stories, you should visit somerville.wickedlocal.com. And be sure to visit us at Somerville Media Center at somervillemedia.org.